Many years ago, I was in a bookshop in Athens. It was an old bookshop, a very beautiful one, sold secondhand books. I was on, I was in Greece on a on holiday, and it was hot, and there were crowds outside. So I went inside this bookshop, and it wasn't very useful. All the books were in Greek, but there was there were a few that were in English, and among them were the collected works of Aristotle, translated into English by Oxford University Press, published in the beginning of the 20th century. And I wasn't very interested in this. I'm a scientist, not a philosopher. I knew vaguely about Aristotle, but, you know. But there was one of the books caught my eye, and it was this one here. It, it's, it's, it was called Historia Animalium, the history of animals. And I'm a zoologist, so I thought, wow, animals. I mean, how nice. And I, and I opened it up, and I, and, and I began to read. And here's the thing that amazed me, is that I, I read about the internal anatomy of snails, the organs, the digestive glands, the esophagus. He describes it all in detail. And, and this is exactly as I knew it. I mean, as I had learnt it when I was an undergraduate. And it was... It was wonderful. I had no idea that Aristotle knew this. He, as it were, spoke to me across 2,500 year years. And, moreover, the translator of the book, a famous zoologist called Darcy Thompson, said, I think it can be shown that Aristotle did his biological work in his middle age and that his favorite hunting ground was the calm lagoon at Pira. Where was this lagoon? Well, it turned out it was in the island of Lesbos in the eastern Aegean. So that night I took the ferry and I went there and I spent two weeks looking at Aristotle's animals on the shores of this lagoon, which is where biology was founded. And, well, I've been working Aristotle's been a part of my life ever since. I've written a book about him, done a TV series, and all about how he discovered biology and what he did there. So Aristotle is, let's say, 37 or so at the time. He's just gone across the Aegean. He's left Plato's academy. The year is around 345 BC, and he's just married. We think that his, his wife was very young, and the reason we think so is because he says in one of his works, the best age for a man to marry is 37, and we know he was 37 at the time. He's, and the best age for a woman to marry is 18, so we're guessing that she was 18. He's a great man for rationalizing everything. And then he goes to Lesbos, probably to this lagoon, and he begins, for the very first time in history, to begin asking about the biological world. He picks up a snail, he opens it up, and he asks for the very first time what's inside. It's not that people hadn't cracked open snails, but they'd done it to eat, right? And he begins to accumulate information, all the information about the biological world from hunters, fishermen, ga fishermen uh, 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 farmers, wherever he can get, get information from, and he starts sorting it out, and he puts it in this book. And he doesn't just write one book about animals, right? This is the very first. He write, in fact, he, in fact, he writes over the course of his life, well, eight or nine of them. And, and, and they are a complete science of biology. Historia Animalium, the book that I picked up, the first, it's, it's not a natural history, it's not an encyclopedia full of silly stories like Pliny wrote, the Roman. Instead, it's a database. It's a way for, to take all this information, array it out, sort it out, so that he can use it, see the patterns, that then become the target for explanations in the rest of his books. So, for instance, he has a book called The Part of Anim Parts of Animals, in which he describes the relationships between parts and why creatures have the parts they do, why birds have certain kinds of beaks, and if so, why, why birds with long, thin beaks have long legs because they have to walk through water and use their, their beaks by spears, and why other birds have talons and... and, 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 and and, and, and hooked-nosed bills, um, you know, like a hawk or an eagle, 
and so on and so on and so on. And he describes all this in great detail. And it seems actually all very Darwinian. He's, it's not, though. Um, uh, and then he has in other books on the locomotion of animals. He explains how they walk in the light of his physics. He has books about the, the, about the, uh, about the, chemis the, the biochemistry, what we would now call the biochemistry of, 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 of creatures, uh, uh, about how they keep themselves alive, the internal fire. It's, it's an entire physiological description. He's sort of a one-man biology department. And then we have his greatest book, his most brilliant book, which is The Generation of Animals. And in The Generation of Animals, he opens for the very first time a, a chicken egg and watches a chick lying there on its bed of albumen with its little heart beating and describes how it changes over its course, over the course of time to develop into a chicken, to come into being, as Aristotle says. And it's the first time that anybody ever does that. It is a magnificent accomplishment, all told. It's difficult to evaluate, in some ways. So many of the specifics are wrong. Aristotle's physics was wrong. His chemistry runs on four elements. So his, his, how, how he thinks animals would walk doesn't entirely make sense because if, well, if your mechanics, if your underlying mechanics don't, right? Uh, and, his, and, if his, and, and if your chemistry runs on four elements, then your physiology can't be that good. And yet, and yet, it is so brilliant and so illuminating, you can trace through ideas from Aristotle that shape our entire field, even though we do not know it. He is, his thought is, how shall I put it? It's like a subterranean river that surfaces now and then and influences us, even though we don't even know it. He, he has what gives us the very structure of our thought. One of my favorite ideas, and it's one of his most important ideas, for example, is his idea of the soul, the suke. He was not the first person to write about the soul. Plato did. Homer uses the term suke. And of course, well, we've used it ever since. But Aristotle's soul is not our soul. It's not the Judeo-Christian soul. You mustn't imagine it as being some sort of mystical entity, you know, that is to do with bound up with our religious beliefs. Not at all. Aristotle is very clear, the soul of an animal is the principle, the thing that keeps a creature alive. And when an animal dies, its soul dies with it. Or better yet, when its soul falls apart, an animal dies. What is this thing? I think it is in what we would now call the interrelation of parts that, that are responsible for life itself. It is the system that keeps a creature alive, which is why, for instance, I would argue that Aristotle is the very first systems biologist. But the thing that he gives us is actually more profound than that. And it's so simple, but it's why you have to love him if you're a biologist. There's a passage which, with which he begins his book on the parts of animals. And you have to, I think to understand the passage, you have to remember that Aristotle was a teacher too. Later in life, he opens a school in Athens. And he gives, a, it's clear that he gives a great course in natural history. The notes, these things that we have, these are his lecture notes, essentially. And, and in this passage, I think you have to imagine that um, we've got a, He's just given a lecture about the internal anatomy of, of some creatures, sea animals, to, uh, to his students, who I think we have to imagine are, quite, are sort of gilded Athenian youths, rather spoilt, a little bit prissy. And now he says he's got a bunch of cuttlefish or, 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 or fish from, this, from the local fish market, and they're sitting there and decaying in the, in, the, in the sun, in the heat, no refrigeration. And he says, all right, now go cut them up. Pick one of those things up, cut it open, and look. Do what I did. Look what's inside and describe it. And they go, mm, 
and he gets irritated. And this is what he says. It's a paraphrase. He says, we must not shy like children from in disgust from the humblest creatures because even in the most humble of animals there is order and goodness even there in that order and its forms of the combinations of that order there is beauty too Scholars, modern scholars, call that passage, which I've misquoted a little bit, but it, I've got the essence of it, the invitation to biology. And it was the first time that anybody ever said it. <laughs>